thank you everybody for being here tonight. Well, my name is Li Zhou and I am a telling story intern here at working with Gina on this wonderful project. And I think tonight we'll just, you know, go ahead and I will, I would like to show you to some highlights of our findings and as well as you know, welcoming you to give us any feedback and suggestions and in any other, you know, any perspective, basically. So without further ado, let's just get started. Um, so about like 110 years after the British East India Company was founded in Newport, Rhode Island, another colony of the Britain, someone we still don't know, commissioned a talented artist, we still don't know, unfortunately, to create this multi-layered imagination and interpretation of their understanding of the East, or we see otherness on the wall in their residency. So recently, we were very lucky that to be able to date the murals back to around 1710-ish uh, due to a specific type of horse hair that we found uh, within the plasters that those paintings were directly painted on. And um, so I want to give you a little bit like introduction or background on this project just in case like you have no idea about this project before. And so it was um, actually discovered by accident uh, due to a water damage when workman was trying to fix the water damage along the uh, ceilings and the panels and they removed the panels as you can see here, those black mud boards and they found this set of whole murals within this room with a whole a layer of whitewash on top. And um, so other evidence also suggests that these murals were like, uh, at least these two walls were all covered with this mural. And when they installed the windows on this site, they destroyed part of it. So when we found them, they're still just this, what we have for now left. And um, conservation works have been done many times actually during the past uh, couple of decades. And uh, for example, that's what, that one was in uh, when they were first revealed. And I really want to argue that actually the main images, the iconographies or what was happening going on actually pretty intact at that time. So I would argue that those conservations actually did a great job leaving all these main things or images on it. So um, in the early inventories of this house, the room was referred to as the great room. So you can imagine some sort of social functions within, maybe just like, you know, imagine you as a guest, uh, as a guest being invited into this space and thinking about being surrounded with this set of murals, highly possibly these two walls also had, we are not sure, but likely, and um, kind of like immersed within this environment, how will you feel as a guest back to that early, like early 18th century. So except for the mural, as you can see here, we have uh, two other surviving wooden panels, and those two were framed into a, door um, and was used upstairs third floor for many years until we found it. It's uh, really kind of like in the similar style with our murals here, but um, that's what we have for now. All of us, like uh, all of these murals plus these two wooden panels. And there are also evidence shows or documentary, uh, document um, showing that there used to have more murals left in the upper floors, but we just couldn't trace them where are they anymore or maybe they just lost or you know unfortunately but still we have what we have now here and so far scholars have argued that uh, only one other example of this type of decoration dating from the first quarter of the 18th century survived in the american colonies and uh, which is this Varner house i have to be make sure that Werner Varner, i didn't pronounce mix them together but that same Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Uh, the murals here, you see, bears actually not much similarities as ours. If you really see the conversations or the styles, and they depict like figures like Native Americans, full body size, and a man on a horseback here, and somebody was being uh, decapitated by a person, and um, saving an angel is coming or something, a lot of going on as well. But one thing similar, like shared between ours and here is there always there are some very violent things ongoing, some actions are going. And if you are familiar with ours and you see that we have two panels actually bearing this very violent 
I would say bloody, yeah, uh, depictions. So how unique and important our mural is, despite the fact that it survived from the early 18th century, which can represent a very early part of American material culture or colonial American material culture. The significance were also addressed by previous scholars when it was first revealed in uh, 1937. For example, people considered it as uh, nothing more important has been found in all of colonial America, or people said that it's a unique example that, you know, more skillfully than the, any that happened in New England or in colonial America for that matter, or so far no similar work has been found. And this scholar, Nina Fletcher Little, she wrote a book about uh, American decorative wall published in 1952. And uh, here she mentioned specifically of this set of mirror and saying it might be a reference of this exported Chinese wallpapers or, or wallpaper panels. and. Um, she also raised up a question arguing that this could be an experiment with fashionable chinoiserie for interior woodwork and indicates that architectural Japan was occasionally attempted. Even though I think her work contains some sort of debate and uncertainty, but uh, still I uh, think she really brought up some good directions in researching this set of mural. First is, as I wrote it here, chinoiserie. Um, the second is Japani, and shinwazuri is a term basically meaning in the Chinese style or after the Chinese style. It's a decorative style that was extremely fashionable since the 17th century and throughout the whole long 18th century. And I just want to show you some examples that illustrate what uh, shinwazuri was or is. And this is a vase from a uh, mason factory. They were all made in early and mid 18th century, and this one made I'm sure like um, who live in or who visited some mansions in Newport must be very familiar about some similar kind of like depictions. And this is with the name of Chinese musicians. Um, and it was made by the Chelsea porcelain manufacturer in mid 18th century. And this is an engraving belonging to a set of engraving. And this one is called the Chinese garden, it was also made in mid 18th century. And this one uh, was a, a secretary made in Venice, Italy, and early 18th century as well. So just want to give you an overall sense of what Shinwazuri is. And in terms of Japani, it is a technical word that, technical word that refers to European and American craftsmen's responded imitation of East Asian lacquerwares imported into Europe and America. Instead of using the lacquer stamp from the trees that only grow within uh, East and Southeast Asia, they combined the different resins and with other materials to create a very shiny surface and very richly, can be very richly decorated surface to at the very beginning in, imitate um, lacquerware, but later I would argue that Japan was really became a separate kind of a catalog that a category that uh, a lot of talented craftsmen contributed uh, their talents in it and um, created all this such a you know amazing piece of works. Uh, so if you have seen a specific type of oh my God, I'm so hot. Sorry guys, <laughs> Ooh, I should put my hands, but. If you have seen a specific type of Chinese uh, lacquerware called caramel screen, you might find that there are so many similarities compared with ours with the caramel screen. And let's just have a closer look about uh, this specific type of screen uh, lacquerwares that were popularly imported to uh, Europe and America since the 17th, well, mainly 18th century. So caramel screen refers to a ty specific type of uh, technique. It's called like a polychrome carved lacquer techniques. So basically the technique is like you applied layers, layers of lacquer on top of your wooden surface substrate until you make a smooth layer. And then you use a specific type of tool like a knife and you carve it the outlines of what you want to achieve on your imagery. And then you mixed uh, colored materials with other oil or lacquers, and then you basically inserted them along what you just carved and created this very colorful and rich narratively, you know, speaking surface. Um, so this one is an 
example collected, sorry, within the universe, Chinese University of Hong Kong. And uh, this one was made in the late 17th or early 18th century. And you see uh, the common thing for Caramondo screen was always kind of uh, celebratory or auspicious. And for example, they always have a they always have a man saying, as you can see here, what is happening? The lady was having, I think, her birthday. That's what they said uh, around, on their website, I think. And there are people celebrating for her birthday, and um, there were people just hanging around, enjoying time, having fun, and uh, I don't know, walking with animals or kinds of things. But they're always surrounded with one man image and surrounded by different uh, borders. You see decorated with flowers, with um, antiques or, uh, you know, some geometric or lotus flower borders and narrow one. And this is, oh, I actually put this so that you can have a closer look about this specific gorgeous technique as well as the depictions of the figures. And this is another example. This is actually, I think, shares more similarities than other, with others in terms of uh, the color choices or the way they depict the architecture and the combination of architecture and um, those little ponds and landscapes around. And um, so now we have, oh, another thing I want to point it out is see this little smaller panels around. If you look at ours, we also have smaller panels that try to, you know, show as like mounted uh, at the bottom. So we'll cover, we can see it later. But yes, that, so now we have an idea of what a Caramondo screen is and um, do they always stay in the same form when they were exported to Europe and America? Do they, were they always used as screens, you know, as a piece of furniture? So. If you see ours, you definitely know the answer is no. And we'll see how some examples. So this is a drawing, one of the drawings I love the most. I love it so much. And uh, this was painted about 1700. It uh, is called the Chinese shop. And it's highly likely painted uh, in Netherlands and Amsterdam actually, which was at that time the center of Asian export goods as well as the center of lacquerwares in Europe. And it really like illustrates the interior of a shop selling Asian goods. But there are so many funny things. Um, so first of all, we see that lacquerwares, they are in different forms that might be a caramondo or other type of lacquer screens, but there are furnitures, there are objects and there are frames. So this is not just um, export wares, but also you know, Japaning, as we just said, this beautifully done uh, pieces. And the one interesting thing I love the most is uh, the figures that they were depicting. None of them looks like Chinese to me. They're more like Turks. Um, but, you know, at the same time, they were really trying hard. Look at those paintings. They were trying to depict some sort of, you know, landscape Chinese like ink paintings or, you know, landscape paintings. But at that time, they had portraits of these people. They have people sitting here. And I love this, this little cat. I don't know what that is, but this little cat is so cute. So, sorry. Oh, thank you so much. Lifesaver. Oof. Okay, here we go. Yeah. So you see, um, oh, where am I? Okay. So it would, I, uh, Let's just say another example. So this example can directly, more directly refers to ours. So this was an exported Carmando screen, just as I mentioned earlier, and it was mounted on the wall as a whole. And it was done before uh, 1659. It was now at the Rice Museum, but it was used to be, uh, okay, let's see. It was made for the court of the state holders at Louvendorf. Yeah, so the princess would came in, uh, it was at that time furnished with some exotic furnitures and objects and the princess would came in and enjoy her tea in this room. So another example, if you ever went to Elm, you definitely know like uh, this is not Caramondo, this is black lacquer with gold, but they were cut it into separate pieces, individual pieces and mounted separately on the wall. And um, 
this was this piece I put here because it was done in uh, 18th century, um, more kind of directly to ours. So uh, following the ways of European's interpretation, our mural actually illustrates an even complicated way. The artist designed the whole composition just like the effect of mounting individual panels on the wall, but instead of really mounting, they painted on the wall. And that's just genius. So let's ha now have a closer look on some of the details of our imageries and trying to see where they could possibly come from, where the artist reference on which, what things. So here is an example, the depiction of the lotus leaves on the water and the water ripples. Uh, can you tell like which one is ours, which one is from a caramel screen? Well, this is ours. <laughs> yeah, well, it's kind of obvious, but still like you see the way they uh, depict the lotus leaves and they want to try to show that there are ripples on the pond. And even though the forms are different, but the color choices are very much following the uh, caramel screen. And here we have uh, some, a lot of hats. Um, the three, the top three were actually from Werner House. You see, even though they are uh, sort of similar, but they are still a little bit different. And the rest of them were from are from different caramel screens and actually different hat. I would argue that indicate different roles or different occupations, this person, the different roles they were playing within this whole narrative. And ours doesn't really have that strong sense of you know role playing, indicating what role they were, but still uh, the different hats differentiate different characters. And um, we have this one, the landscape painting uh, on the realms. You see here the ink ones. And here we have in Car on Caramano screen, we have very similar ones. But we don't know if they reference the Caramano screen or actually reference the pattern books from Shinwazari books already existed in Europe. So this is a codex called Shfus Codex. Uh, it was, I think, made in 17, early, very early 1800 sorry, 18th century, and uh, was used by Mason Factory to create, you know, this sort of uh, Shinwazari depictions, uh, imageries on their uh, productions. But anyway, you see the landscape paintings around the realm here already existed. So we don't know our artists, like maybe they reference directly from the current on the screen or directly or, you know, indirectly from the, 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 Shinwaz uh, the Shinwazari pattern books. Um, so we have our only female figure here. Despite the suspicious red orange ish hair, we don't know where it came from. Um, but if we compare it with Caramondo screens, in terms of their, the, their hairstyle and as well as the costumes, they actually share a very similar vocabulary for me here. But if we look at other uh, female figures, especially holding the specific folded fans in the pattern books, and we see, I would argue that they actually looks more similar as theirs and compare with Chinese ones. Um, and I just also want to point it out, those little dots you see on her, oh, on her clothes, and you can see it all over the place on those Shinwazari porcelains or ceramics all over the place, the little dots indicating these patterns. And here is a book uh, called, the, this is from the book, An Embassy from the East India Company. This book was referred by scholars that really kind of, they try to dry, uh, address some connections with ours, but you still can see this kind of folded fans was used, like always accompanied with female figures. And here we have this uh, guy, the judge, the king, the ruler. We don't know who he is. He's in that panel, that one. He is definitely, um, yeah, in the a center role. Yes, this one. Yeah, he's wearing, he's sitting comfortably, I would argue, like on a cushion with some complicated patterns and he's holding something. But the thing he's holding, like everybody sort of are holding the same things, the red stick. Yeah, and he is wearing a crown and indicating that he is a ruler because he has bodyguards here. And um, so he took in charge of this narrative. 
And we found this also from the embassy from the uh, East India Company. This one is actually very similar to ours. The cushion here with patterns and the way they sit on the cushion and except for what, what they were wearing at the front, they were actually very similar. And similar here, I just want to point it out that he is wearing some kind of crown on his head. Um, so other than this possible, possible influences, the artist in Newport really used his own creativity and imagination because when you see the boat, you just really have no idea what the boat, what the boats are. <laughs> yeah, but they're boats, functionally speaking. Um, that this one, yeah, is uh, from Caramel Screen, and this is our. We have two boats actually on that panel. If you want to have a closer look later, there are two monster-ish like were what kind of creature? I have no idea. And Gina just pointed out like what is on this boat hat. Kind of like a common thing like following everybody was holding something and even the boat but anyway it has a tile and has it was peacefully <laughs> riding on the on the lotus leaf pond or okay, whatever so you see our our mural really shows an apparent you know reference very actually direct reference from Caramondo screens, I would argue, and other Shinwazri references from Europe, but also added their own interpretation and techniques. And um, just as scholars like uh, I don't I don't think she's here, Carolyn Carolyn Frank. I want to mention her because she wrote a, a whole book chapter on this mural, and um, she has already pointed out that. This mural exemplifies that the Shinwazri influences started during colonial America and colonial Americans saw themselves as part of a world that is larger than just Britain and Europe. Like colonial America is not remote. That's what she argued in her book based on this. And uh, I actually think uh, it makes sense. Like it's really like combining everything for us, like and then inter inserting their own expressions. And here uh, I want to, I photoshopped this three panel. As you see that they are not like next to each other. There are um, always another panel in between, but I just exclude those birds and rocks because I don't think they are really telling a narrative. Uh, they're more like a decorating function. But uh, when you put these three together, do you think they're, the murals are trying to tell a story, a narrative based on that? I don't know, from the very, from the, this panel, the first one, it seems that everybody, this crowd of people like was approach, is approaching from the water to the land, to somebody or somewhere at least like toward that way. And unfortunately we lost that part because of the window. We don't know what are they heading to, where are they heading to, but they are all heading to that way. They seemed are armed. You see they're holding this kind of thing, the, hunting or something but they are approaching to somewhere and i also want to argue that this group of uh, people are the same here and the same here okay now it's assumptions that i'm going to make <laughs> yeah it's really like well we'll just say and the second panel you see this uh poor little guy kneeled down and waiting to be Decapitated again, yes, and this our ruler is sitting here and trying to, I think, trying to judge his fate and um, with his bodyguards, I said that before. And then the third panel is like, okay, after the judge was made, the judgment was made, this little guy, poor man, was being punished here with the same group of people. So if you look at the panels from this way to that way, uh, it seems for me it's kind of trying to tell a narrative. And um, I put them together and was just like staring at my computer screen and saying, what are they trying to tell? And some, someday, um, I, all of a sudden I remember that the exhibition I went a couple of years ago in New York about the, the underworld in East Asia, so it means the hell in East Asia. Then I started to look into the imageries um, in the hills of East Asia. So I did some a little bit of research, and um, so current scholarships 
point out that after the 12th century, what dominated East Asians understanding of hell, of underworld, was basically the 10 kings of hell images. As you can see here, this is an example. We have a judge or king here. Uh, he is because he's a, you know, the biggest uh, figure within this whole image. And uh, somebody was trying to report him to him. He's holding his beard, I think. He's trying to make a decision. And he also have the companies uh, on, the, on each side. And after he made his decision, this little, all these people were being tortured with different ways because based on what they have done when they were still alive. And I, this type of, sorry, the 10 Kings of Hell really turned um, into like some more secular, more common, like a uh, widespread version during the Qing Dynasty, which is like closer to our time period. And uh, there is a book called Yu Li Bao Chao, in English is Jade Records, and um, sort of illustrate this kind of, turned this 10 kings of hell, this very fixed imagery to a like, kind of like a book, a comic book for people to read and they were printed on wood blocks. And you see, this is the first step basically when you passed away and um, the group of people from the hell would come to your home. So which is a secular architecture place. It's your, you know, from sort of familiar environment architecture and guiding your soul to the court or to the hell and where you will be judged and uh, they will be judged and they will be hmm, punished. And uh, here I just want to put them all together. So this is a Qing version um, and let me just see hell. And this one is a more later one, but this is a 16th, 17th century and this is ours. So I'm just like, you know, putting them together thinking, is there any possibility that person or people from here, artists from here, got the accessibility to reference this concept of hells at that time. It seems very impossible. And I was, I am also trying to find more proof on that, but uh, all I can find so far was some um, wood prints and some paintings that was exported, well, brought from China back to Europe that was collected during the same time period, like featuring some tortures, but not exactly the same as what I try to establish here. But um, I also put them all together just to give a overall sense that's our guy, that's this guy, and that's from other Xinhuazhui pattern books or explorer books, and that's the hill, and Chinese hill. And this is from Treatise of Japaning, uh, book, another pattern book. So. Uh, still, the story is waiting to be told, and um, but I'm just going to wrap up here um, for now. And I would really love any of your suggestions and you know comments, any other questions. Uh, but this is, as you can see, such a complicated subject, and it contains this multiple culture exchanges or interpretations. But definitely, it is, as the previous scholar said, a very unique example of colonial American material culture. And thank you so much for, for listening. Yeah. Okay.